as I was telling that Bangladesh is the second largest delta in the world, and its major river systems like Padda and the Jomuna, they originate in the Himalayas and passes through India and even China and culminates into the Bay of Bengal and passing through Bangladesh. While passing through Bangladesh, these major river systems uh, also brings huge amount of silt and deposits it in downstreams in Bangladesh. At the same time, these mighty rivers, due to hydrological reasons, change their course and erode their banks. And this is unlike earthquake, where it takes all of a sudden, a, a, say after 100 or 50 years in a country like, uh, in a country, or like the cyclone which we get early warning. But this uh, uh, riverbank erosion is taking place every day, somewhere or other in Bangladesh, and this is a phenomena which is, we are used to. There are differing accounts about the extent of damage flood riverbank erosion makes. I'll just play a video just to let you see the, how helpless we are when this riverbank are causing it big gets eroded. There are different accounts of uh, the socioeconomic impact of riverbank erosions. Like there, are, uh, some say that it is $500 million per year, and about 300,000 people are made homeless every year. There are many different news uh, items almost every day in the newspapers about this riverbank erosion and its effects on the people. Displacement is the immediate impact of riverbank erosions, making people homeless. These homeless people who once had everything overnight becomes jobless, homeless, and landless. And they migrate to the nearby flood embankments or end up their life in miserable life in slums like Dhaka. Riverbank erosion is like a silent cancer. You can't do anything about it. It will be taking your everything, I mean, what you had. In the year 2015, 2005, an NGO undertook a project uh, called Disappearing Lands Supporting Communities Affected by Riverbank Erosions. So this project was a holistic project which was uh, undertaking not only like housing, but it was also addressing the needs of the uh, riverbank erosion affected communities with uh, innovative livelihood generation and other things. So it was a holistic approach also in the sense that this project was undertaken in Gaibanda district in Sundarganj and Fulchari Upojalas. So there were about 10,000 people under the project, and they engaged local NGOs, local uh, government officials, local administration, even the local elected union Parishad Upajalas, and of course, also the architects. And we thought that this is an opportunity for us to take, and also, although these are not, I mean, economically or financially rewarding as the projects we do in cities, but we decided that we should take this opportunity to see whether we can do anything about these people. And under the project, there were four villages, and these four villages were developed not simultaneously, but one at a time over a period of four years. And that gave us a time to also uh, develop based on our experiences, as we did not have any previous example to refer to. And from the beginning, as I was saying, that we, we engaged the beneficiaries and the local stakeholders at the all stages, like selection of the most deserving uh, candidates for the housing, because housing, we were providing only four villages with 400 houses. So there were many more than four, 400 families. So who are the deserving ones? It was selected by the, uh, the community themselves. And then we also engaged them 
the local people in the selection of the sites of the villages, and also after the, they moved into the village for their livelihood. We engaged in every step, as I was saying, that the local community. We engaged the local day laborers in earth excavation, for raising the village grounds above the flood level. And we have been able to generate about 150,000, 55,000 man days of work for the local people during the construction. We trained local masons, local carpenters, as well as we also engaged the local women folks in the construction. And this is how, after the first village was built in 2005, this is how they look in, during winter. It had, against the dry river beds, you can see the villages, and during monsoon with water all around. And when the first village was occupied by the beneficiaries, it was a very emotional moment for all of us, because we could feel that how these all homeless, landless people will be feeling with us. And this is, I'll, maybe these plans or the drawings may not be always very uh, exciting, but just for communication's sake, I'm using them. This is the second village, it's called Sripur, where we could not get a single parcel of land, so it was just beside two parcels of lands, like this one and this one, and it was, as I was saying, it was a learning experience. In this first two villages, we dug ponds to have, uh, the, use the art for raising the villages above flood level. But unfortunately, it was not working because the ponds did not have water because of the sandy soil. So this was a learning for us. We had similar learnings and we built upon our experiences from first, second, third villages. We all know, like, courtyard is the heart and soul of a village homestead. These women folks, they spend almost whole day in these courtyards and do all their works, like cooking, drying uh, crops and things like that in this courtyard. This was the second village where we had this kind of courtyards and the houses like in the traditional villages of Bangladesh. They were having kitchen gardens as well. Now, this is the third village known as Poshchi Belkarchar. This has an irregular shape and we changed our design of the houses as well as the cluster of the houses. And we had housing as well as cattle sheds, latrines, water sanitation facilities like bathing places, school, and so on. This is a typical house in the Poshim uh, Belkarchar where we had these houses designed for four to six family members. And this was a one large room like this is a one large node dividable into two rooms for privacy and for extension, there is a futures extension area and a kitchen garden space, a compact, I mean, a veranda for cooking and other activities. And this is the house, how it looked when constructed, just after the construction. This is a cluster where you can see that there are 10 families living with a cattle shed, a biogas plant, latrines, and so on. This is just after construction, the Poshim Belkarchar village. This is how it looked in 2010. They had their baths and latrines. This is a uh, community livestock shed. And we also had schools. The school was designed for uh, elementary education and the non-formal education for the villagers. And this is how these were schools were designed in the villages. We can see children studying in the villages and they are happy too. And in the break time, this is how they are in the village going back to their homes. And these schools are not only for the, meant for the children of the village, but surrounding villages as well. We also designed a, a community hall with minimum materials to reduce cost, like we did not have any window in this hall. We rather created brick jallies to make it simple and 
airway as well as for light and ventilation. The community uh, people were using it for different community activities and meetings for them. This is how it looked after completion in 2009. As I was telling that beside the housing, actually the major project, main project was focusing on the livelihood, alternative and innovative livelihood activities for the villagers. Like for example, as the, they did not have any water body like ponds for themselves, they were trained to have cage aquaculture so that they can, individual family can have their own cage for fish, rare, fish cultivation and so on. They were trained to have duck farming in open water as they did not have their own open water, their own water bodies. They were also growing vegetables on floating water, uh, vegetable beds on during monsoon in the open water. They were also trained to have other activities like weaving, then sandbar cultivation, which is a huge success. It has become now a mainstay of uh, activities during dry season for the uh, jobless people or the unemployed people of the region of Gaibanda. And it is such a successful thing that these pumpkins actually are, has long shelf life of about six months. So once, when they produce it in uh, winter, in dry season, in the chores, they can sh keep it for about six months and during monsoon, when they are unemployed, they either sell them in the market or they cook them as vegetable. And this is such a success, that it is, they are now exporting to many different countries, these pumpkins. Now I'll just present a few slides of one of the villages which we visited in 2014 after five years of completion of the village, just to see how they are doing. This is one of the scenes. This is a window, actually. I just picked up this uh, photograph because this, is, this allows uh, wind to pass through but uh, protects the rooms from uh, rain. This child was born in that village. This is uh, one afternoon in the veranda of the village in 2014. This is how they're leading their life. A good harvest. A farmer with his livestock and cattle feeds in one of the livestock sheds. A happy girl. Can you guess why I'm showing this apartment building in Dhaka and what is the relationship between this building and the those villages. Can you guess, anyone? Okay, let me explain. Uh, this apartment building can house 36 families, and with the money of this, the equal, I mean, we can build 3,600 houses with the money of building one of these buildings, one of these building, uh, the apartment building. So it is equal to that. I mean, this is which proves that this is possible to undertake similar projects in these areas and, and solve and mitigate the problems of these uh, homeless people. It reminds me of a quote from Mahatma Gandhi, that art provides enough to satisfy every man's need, but not to satisfy every man's greed. Well, with this, do we want uh, those people, those to lead a miserable life in the slums of Dhaka, or do we want them to lead a dig life of, with dignity in a village where they, have, they had everything and where they can have their own uh, lifestyle. So in this regard, I'll just now play a video taken in November 2015 in one of the villages. This was just to show that how they're leading their life uh, with the dignity. And this is the village Poschim Belkarchar. This was designed, uh, completed in 2009, and this is in 2015. This is, I mean, you just compare their life 
which they had in to, uh, before the uh, these villages were there, they could have ended up in the one of the slums. Now they are having this kind of nice village life with all their livelihood activities, income gen income possibilities, and this is how it looks, and how serene and how beautiful is this villages. Now the trees are grown up, and the courtyards are active with children, with women folks doing their works. And, and I wish that our policymakers, the donors, they realize that these kind of projects are needed uh, with the projects like mega projects, like multi-million dollar river embankments, flood embankments, or river training. These are only a fraction of those costs. And this can solve a problem which these millions, hundreds and thousands of people are facing. So let us also try to see whether we can do something. And this project proves that it is possible to take a holistic approach to solve these problems we are facing every day and our people are facing every day. Thank you.